Good evening. Hello. We're beginning the summary of our 11th conference of INSS. Today, this afternoon, in one of the panels, uh, we had General in Reserves Kaplinsky, the former Deputy Chief of Staff, and he said, the following, 50 years we're in the territories, I quote, we have to make a decision what we're going to do. IDF has a lot of capabilities to ensure an agreement wherever it is determined by the political echelon. We are now hosting uh, the members of Knesset. Tamar Zandberg from Meretz, please come up. Stav Shafir from the Zionist Union. Yoav Kish from the Likud and Moti Yogev from the Jewish home. That's the name of the party. Please come up. We arrange them from left to right so everybody is happy. And now I want to go over with you, ladies and gentlemen, about the rules of the game. Every speaker has three minutes to present his political vision, his or the his parties. If there's a difference between the two, then tell us. After that, we're going to have a few quick rounds of Q&As, a minute and a half for each answer, and then summary or response from the others. Also, a minute and a half at the end of the session. We are going to focus on uh, the uh, uh, realization of the Zionist vision vision of uh, the state of Israel in the Palestinian Israeli conflict. What's good for Israel? How can we preserve what uh, was built here before? What's the right way to do it? What about the responsible steps that we have to take? And actually, we're talking here about two perceptions that are basically controversial. They're contradicting. Why there's no other way than separating from Palestinians? We have to strive towards two-state solution. On the other hand, uh, the eastern border of the state of Israel should be the Jordan River with all its implications. In this institute, we ask ourselves every year, throughout the year, and we also uh, check it and investigate it. What can we do? What's right to do? What should we do? And we arrive each time to similar uh, conclusions, but they change and develop with time. First of all, we recommend that Israel will have an initiative. It should be proactive and not just drag its feet, and that it's going to happen whether we go for a negotiation, if there is an agreement or not. The uh, preferred solution for Israel in the long term, please uh, don't uh, speak yes, it's not the Knesset here. Look, we're a research institute here, it's not the Knesset, uh, no interpolations, exactly. You'll have an opportunity to speak as well. We ask ourselves all the time, what are the solutions to the entire range we have between the extreme right and the extreme left, and the various plans, various outlines, what's a preferred solution for Israel, and realize that the best solution in the long term is two states for two peoples, and this is a solution that will give us security, uh, stability, uh, going out of the stalemate. Uh, I think we're, there's a distinction between the main clusters of settlements and the Jewish neighborhoods in East Jerusalem that were and will be in any outline, any agreement, uh, part and parcel of the State of Israel. And we see the need to distinguish between those and the settlements that are uh, the depth of the um, uh, area uh, on the east of the fence. And we think there should be an integration of uh, dialogue and action in the region, in the Israeli-Palestinian aspect, and also independent steps that will promote or preserve at least the possibility to reach one day to two states for two people and or to preserve the conditions to separate. In all this, we see a gradual advancement to a reality of two states, even without an agreement, uh, something that is compelling, committing, binding, and a quick 
uh, understanding and uh, of uh, independent decisions as well that uh, will abide by the terms that I mentioned. All this has to be accompanied, of course, but internal discourse, and that's what we'll try to do now in a minute or two, and uh, also in the public, and also the Israeli society as well as the Palestinian one, to get the legitimacy to do these things to for the policy, for the directions. As for Gaza, maybe we're not going to touch upon Gaza too much, but we'll say nevertheless that as far as Gaza, we see a need for a long ceasefire in the Strip uh, together with the rehabilitation and the humanitarian uh, assistance, uh, Palestinian governance both in Gaza and in Judea Samaria to give them the responsibility for their own affairs and all that has to be accompanied by independent steps and eventually there'll be a negotiation. We do not recommend anything until there's a real agreement. At the moment it's not, not even possible, the permanent agreement. We don't uh, recommend to take the IDF out, we recommend to leave it. Um, the army, and, uh, and then, of course, the future of the settlers is going to be negotiated, that's uh, in the clusters, those that are in the main areas, if possible, this evening, to try to detach ourselves for one hour from this automatic dichotomy of right and left, and from the uh, defining the one plan of the one is completely crazy and the other completely detached from reality, dreams, etc., then if we do that, then we did a good thing. So let's begin with a presentation of three minutes each, from right to left. Moti, you're the first one. Good evening, uh, with your permission, Gilad and all the people, my colleagues. I'm going to present my uh, vision. Some things are the same as my party, something disinuance. I see the uh, Israel uh, Jewish uh, the democratic set, uh, state prosperous in all the aspects, economy, uh, policy, that uh, is a homeland for the Jewish people that lives according to the, the Torah, a state that has uh, equal rights to its citizens, light and to the nations, has a good impact on Israel and the entire world. The five pillars these are the founding stones that I wrote down. First of all is the faith, the vision that the uh, land of Israel belongs to the state of Israel because of the divine promise in the Bible, no book of any other base. This is why we got this country. This is our historical faith, the legal faith of the all Israel, the greater Israel. The second is the historical pillar for 3,800 uh, years. This entire land with the borders was promised, belongs to this people. Uh, Exodus from Egypt, it comes back even uh, when it was expelled. It uh, keeps the faith of Muslims. Uh, for the sake of agreement, they built uh, the mosque, uh, Temple Mount, uh, 580 years later. The vision of the two states for the two people that uh, the moderator spoke of, but it was never realistic. It was never, there was never a Palestinian people. There'll never be, there won't be such a state here, a Palestinian state between the Mediterranean and the Jordan. It wasn't and it'll never be. The third pillar is the security one. Uh, we're talking about the Judea and Samaria. They control the entire shore land in one uh, framework. It was the methodological uh, foreign minister of Israel, Abba Ibn, who said uh, that uh, uh, the borders of Auschwitz are from the border to Netanya. Everything, whenever we retreated, it became explosive. Uh, the Oslo Accord, uh, they took uh, the future and we finally got 5,000 uh, casualties. The whole area became a terror zone and therefore the State of Israel will not give up any part of the land of Israel. The uh, a uh, Palestinian state will just be a disaster for Israel. If you don't learn from history, that's what's going to happen. The uh, eastern border is going to be the Jordan and only the continuing of our control on Judea and Samaria will avoid the threats from here, from this area where we're sitting now. It's going to prevent uh, turning the entire Judea and Samaria to a Hamastan like Gaza. The fourth one is uh, the, re the resilience and national agreement. I think that 
that we should become a Jewish and democratic state and to strengthen the settlements in Judea, Samaria, and so a national agreement and consent. Uh, that's what the Israeli democracy has do been doing all this and gradually out of national consent. First of all, the, uh, we will instill the Israeli law on the judicial areas of Judea and Samaria. I conclude, the last one is the international reality, international relationship where, where Israel is an important factor. We'll do the best we can, uh, the United States, uh, Soviet Union, in order to strengthen uh, our relationship and that will bring about regional stability and we're not afraid from a long way. We'll climb up the hill, we'll strengthen the settlement and the security. This is the responsibility to base ourselves all over this country. Thank you very much. We are living in a strange time. On the one hand, far-reaching changes in the region. On the other hand, complete standstill with the Palestinians. This is not a hypothetical discussion. This is the subject that has greatest potential to destroy the state of Israel through a binational state and apartheid. The occupation is the poison pill of Zionism. It is destroying the political system and tainting the political institutions from the army to the legal system. In the face of this, in this reality, I see that it is the leftist camp that has disappeared and we're hearing of all kinds of initiatives of the right, all of which share that they don't relate to the root of the problem. That is the presence of millions of people under Israeli rule but without basic rights. The moment the right rhetorically but not essentially adopted the two-state solution, we declared a victory and we abandoned the reality on the ground. The left continues to adhere to the two-state solution, but that alone cannot serve as a uh, political thought that is trailblazing. The policy of Lapid is no less serious than that of Netanyahu. Note today that Meretz is the only party today that uh, talks the positions of the security of the defense system, and I'm not talking only about various organizations, but also the professional assessments that we hear from the chief of staff, the head of the military intelligence in the ISA in closed forms. The left is accused of being naive. It is clues that in the face of a Middle East that is collapsing, it is stuck on the Palestinian issue. But it is clear that uh, the uh, issue with the moderate Sunni regimes is the, it is the Palestinian issue that counts. It is that that will enable us to leverage our relationship and improve Israel's position in the new coalitions being created in the Middle East. So what then could be that new Israeli thought that the left needs to lead? The first element is that we're not waiting for anyone. The left must define the end of the military occupation and the end of the apartheidization because that is the Israeli goal. The first expression is to reduce the occupation immediately unrelated to any negotiations. Every facilitation must be allowed possible to allow the Palestinians to build wherever they want, to move and travel wherever they want, and most important, to harness international elements to ease the closure on Gaza. Gaza is a catastrophe and the, that price we may pay for many years to come, and that's without saying anything about the moral aspect of imprisoning two people, two million people, unlimited in time. Now is the time to facilitate and ease the restrictions on Gaza. The fact that Israel has become pragmatic only in the weight of violence is one of the worst lessons that we have given to the region. A final settlement of two states is the uh, preferred solution, but it is a means, not a, a holy goal. We must immediately declare the, we must advance uh, concrete steps. One last sentence. This is a moment of danger, but it is also a moment of opportunity. For some reason, uh, very many are afraid to state the simple truth. That's why the left must come back to the playing field and sh take advantage of the opportunities and lead us to a better future. Thank you. You have Kish. Before you start the clock, I'd like to apologize for wearing Crocs. It's because of a medical problem uh, with my foot, uh, and then soon I'll go back to wearing proper shoes. That was uh, the clock has already started ticking, so let me start.
Let me say the following. First of all, we have to understand the essence of the conflict. It's not about 67 or 48. We all recall very well what happened in 1929 and the uh, massacre of the Jewish settlement in Hebron, which was the result of uh, the approach that said that uh, uh, on the one hand, the Jews had returned to their homeland and a, and a Arab population that developed nationalist feelings and would, uh, was unwilling to accept Zionists. From their point of view, it is legitimate. And uh, the leader of the Likud, Jabotinsky, said that only when they understand that they are facing an iron wall will be able to talk with them about peace. And I want to uh, discuss uh, some the solutions that have presented. We have. It's been said that there. It's as if there's only two solutions. On the one hand, two states for two people. The the Palestinians don't even say two peoples. They only say two states. I say that the Palestinian dictatorship in the borders of 1967 is an existential threat. And the second solution, which I don't consider a solution, is a one-state solution. That would be a binational state, a never-ending conflict, and the state of Israel would not be able to remain a Jewish democratic state in those circumstances. And therefore, while I am frustrating some of the people here, but today it is impossible to reach peace. It's impossible. There's no solution. Anyone who looks for a solution today will lead us to failure and pain. And therefore, what do we need to do? We need to look and say to ourselves, in the current situation, Israel will lead an independent step that is based on Israel interests, and that's the plan. I'm talking about the autonomy plan that is based on the plan of Menachem Begin, who it takes a number of principles, which I will present. It maximizes for Israel our benefit. First of all, maximum territory with minimum number of Palestinian inhabitants for Israeli sovereignty. Why? Because all the Palestinians living in the area that, is, uh, that Israel uh, uh, imposes sovereignty over will become Israeli citizens, and we're not interested in that. On the other hand, the large population centers of the uh, uh, Palestinians will remain in autonomous areas, as you can see in the map, in order to create a kind of economic logic. There will be an area that's called I, Israeli territory, where free uh, movement will be allowed without permission from Israel for the Arabs of Judea and Samaria also. That's how we overcome the economic problem. There's a whole chapter that talks about economic peace between the two entities, and I have to sum up because I see that I have 18 seconds. We are at a critical time with uh, uh, stubborn Palestinian intransigence, and we need to uh, uh, apply sovereignty. I am planning to uh, bring bring the decision of the Likud Central Committee Bravo. for legislation to the Knesset. It seems that the fact that uh, you gave me some uh, compliments for keeping the timetable, not for anything else, but that's also something. Time is important. M.K. Stav Shafir. Thank you. Well, today it's difficult to say that we're talking about solutions that are right or left. In both ends, we start seeing uh, solutions that come to the same place. On the side of the white uh, settlers, we start hearing more and more talking about full annexation of the territory, some with the giving citizenships to the Palestinians are not. Uh, on the other radical side, we see similar programs from confederation, etc. The state of Israel has to make a decision. We are now in a tough neighborhood. This neighborhood will have always to have a large force, but it's divided into two. We've got the force that enables us to act in the full force if somebody comes to threaten us. And this is our deterrence, which is very important. And this is also, uh, as opposed to the other one, which uh, by choosing the reality line, and this is what uh, the Zionist Union means to determine our future, to have an impact on our fate, not to wait for something to happen, but to take our fate into our own hands. But the reality is that the right government doesn't take their fate in our hands. What do they do? They wait. They don't, uh, they, 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 they tarry. They don't decide. Uh, we have to act from our interest in every given moment. Our interest is that three million Palestinians, or five, if you 
uh, talk about Gaza at well as well, that they don't become part of the state of Israel. That's the interest. For now that, we need a definite border with them in it. If you decide not to act according to this interest, to continue to build uh, in outposts and settlements, to expand the holding of the land in Judea Samaria, and to continue it also from uh, so-called uh, security theory, we know it's a complete nonsense. There's no connection whatsoever between the expansion of the settlements and the security. In fact, it's the opposite. The fact that most of the uh, army is now invested to co protect uh, the settlements instead of protecting the borderline and instead of preparing the readiness for the future battles and future threats with Hezbollah and maybe it's a war to have to prepare to the next conflict in Gaza or working towards the fact that there wouldn't be a next conflict in Gaza. Instead of that, they're busy to protect the settlements and not the border. Also, this borderline, instead of it being determined, and we know that uh, most of the attacks inside Israel, instead of this fence, uh, will be ended. It's uh, being delayed because of political decisions, because of interests of the settlers in the radical area of the right. We have to decide exactly where we're heading to, and we're going towards a Separation, and we can do it in three axes. First of all, we start with negotiation. The moment we are going to lead it, then we'll have trust in the world to lead this uh, negotiation, and also more trust from the Palestinians. Also, we're not waiting for the Palestinians. We are going to determine the facts in the area. Uh, and let me end with a sentence. Without getting to an agreement, we uh, ensure the existence of uh, an entity side by side with Israel. We don't have to talk about uh, the uh, problems in Judea summary. We can talk about uh, the um, um, citizens. IDF keeps our security, and we also put the Arab initiative on the table. We're going to go in that axis as well in order to create normalization and to have an impact on what's happening. I have many things to say. It's very difficult to say in three minutes, but I suppose that there'll be another possibility. I heard. I heard the bell. Thank you, Sab Shapir. We heard uh, the first round of the perceptions of each and every one of you, but now I remind you of what I said. The words of Kaplinsky, the former deputy chief of staff, IDF, will know how to prepare itself and to give a solution to any outline that the political echelon will decide. Now let's start thinking about it. What about security? You're setting, saying, uh, MK Yogev, uh, that the uh, Palestinian state is a strategic threat on Israel. They have a plan to arrive. Eradicate Israel, we're going to hold the entire area, it's necessary for the security. Now I'm asking you, you're talking about holding the territories because of security, or you're talking about the settlements? Because if you talk about holding the entire territory, what I think I'm hearing you say, that we continue to settle without any limits from the present line to the Jordan without limitations. Is that yes? Yes. Now tell me, please. By the way, it's not my line. It was Trumpeldor's. It was... Uh, yes, wherever we plow the land, he said, this is going to be the border. That's what's happening in the north, and this is what's going to happen also in Judea and Syria. Wherever we plow the land, we're going to have settlers. So why don't you... Uh, exert the Israeli sovereignty on the entire area. Why sh are we today, 40 years on, more than 40 years after the begging government uh, took office, 40 years, two governments with a right-wing uh, uh, government, uh, not one square meters was not annexed to the state of Israel. Why? Well, I said it in Protective Edge. There's a vision, a clear vision. The land of Israel belongs to the people of Israel, to the state of Israel, and some uh, mis uh, missions are achievable. The first foundation is national consent, and this national consent is now being created. After Protective Edge, it took time, and also international legitimacy, these two things are very important for me. The awareness of the people of Israel regarding the connections they have to the land of Israel is now basing itself. Today we have almost a national consent and it continues. This is the democracy that goes with the Jewish side of the uh, coin. We have to do it with responsibility. Therefore there's a nuance 
Uh, I have a plan. Uh, we have to, first of all, uh, do this with the sea zones for the beginning, because what's happening in Jerusalem and in the sea zones will start there. All the Arabs of Judea and Samaria are going to come there. We'll find them all there. And therefore, I'm saying to do it only in places that you can control. You have to do it with responsibility. I also don't want a binational state. Uh, so I said that the Arabs in the Judea and Samaria will live better here than they do in any Arab country today. We cannot uh, evade uh, escape from any territory in Israel. If we do, the terror is going to chase us. That's what happened in the last quote. We have to give to get back the control. You see what happened in the Gaza Strip. We left disengaged. We didn't stop being responsible because no, no country in the world is interested in Gaza. And so 300 uh, kilometers from our settlements uh, makes us uh, responsible for Gaza as well. And we have to help these Arab citizens. Member of Knesset uh, Kish. In terms, of, uh, in terms of security, the program that you are proposing looks good on paper, but in security terms, I don't think how you, I don't understand how you can defend all the Israelis that will remain on the ground. Will you build a, a fence of 1,800 kilometers instead of the 700 that are planned for today, 60% of which is already built? Are you, would you have two divisions to defend that fence? All in all, we are talking about painting stains that look nice on the map, but we're talking about many dozens of small communities, tiny blocks of Palestinian um, communities that we're trying to connect. How do you overcome that problem? First of all, I think you in Oslo painted all kinds of stains on the map. Uh, don't take up my time, please. If you want, you can add time. There's no addition, there are only subtractions. I want to say some things. First of all, there, there, uh, clearly there cannot be a Palestinian state and there won't be any return of refugees, seemingly, ostensibly. The, the, the whole definition of, uh, pal of refugees is uh, uh, contorted and distorted. Um, but how will this plan be applied on the ground? The great advantage of this plan, and it also addresses the day after uh, the after the collapse of the P. I don't know if that will happen when Abu Mazen dies or later, but we'll be there when it does collapse. We have to decide, we'll have to decide what to do. This uh, plan reflects the uh, reality on the ground. I don't plan to build a fence as this is described here. Um, and these uh, boundaries explain what is part of Israeli sovereignty and what's not. The, uh, the matter of the entry of autonomy residents into Israel, it can happen the way it happens today as well. But that doesn't mean that whoever decide, as MK Yogeb said, to enter Israeli territory will get citizenship. No, there is an existing state of affairs, and that's what we'll deal with. Once again, I'm going back. I went to a plan that would enable the reality of life today to exist. What's the problem? After all, the reality re remain will remain shared. We cannot disconnect from them. What happens when three million Palestinians ask for citizenship? You can ask him a question during your time, but they're all talking together. The next question, an accepted claim is that, and we hear this from quite a broad circles in the Israeli public, that every area that we have withdrawn from, evacuated and so on, created a, 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 a security risk that didn't exist before that. What is your answer to that? First of all, factually, that's not true. We can look at it historically. We have a number of people here who are involved in the negotiations in the past, and they can expand on that. When we left Gaza, 
the number of casualties from terror attacks was decreased. The, um, when we left, uh, the, the exit from northern Samaria has also been successful, and from Sinai has been very, very successful. It has managed to improve our uh, security situation, our economic situation, our position in the world, and much more. So not every exit from territory has been bad, and we're not talking about uh, leaving the territory empty uh, or an area where there are terrorist organizations or there's an opening for worse organizations than the ones we know today. I am talking about making the citizens our front. The IDF uh, defends us. When we are setting facts on the ground and creating a clear border and closing the fence so there won't be penetration into Israel to defend that fence and continue to defend the territory while we are increasing the civilian population there that is supposed to protect us instead of the army, this only harms the military activity and that's uh, not even getting into when they attack the soldiers themselves and I won't get into that. In addition to that, we are doing something internationally which we owe to ourselves in order to increase our security, and that means on the one hand, we are using, the and we're talking with the Western world, we're going back to be a, a respected country that the international community cooperates with and trusts, and could, that contributes to us both economically and security. We'll get to the position of Israel in the world. Tamar, I want to ask you, we withdrew from Gaza. We got uh, missiles for all the years since then, and rockets, etc. And we're going to leave to there in Samaria and the area that uh, MK Yogev said, and we'll get uh, missiles at the airport. Who knows what's going to be? Look, the situation at the moment uh, creates a real security danger, which is reflected with continued violence for 50 years. Just to notice, I'm repeating something that I said. Maybe I wasn't strong enough. Merit today is the only factor in the political system that actually reflects uh, the positions that give us security. Not because they uh, put something in the water and they become leftist. Uh, somebody said that. But this is the Israeli interest and this is the evaluation. When I looked at the map of my colleague, look, that he tried uh, in order to escape from the uh, forbidden letters, a, B, C, and he put T and I. Right, exactly, he says. But what can we do that this map is based on things that we know? No. A, B, C, also the position of Moti Yogev from the Jewish home is based on that an annexation of the sea areas. It's enough to look at the map to see what danger it uh, reflects. Your programs is not security. Your uh, programs are because of uh, political and, uh, let's say, even racist ideas. Maximum territory, minimum Arab. You just uh, see that this map is a product of uh, the slandered uh, Oslo. Usually the PA that you uh, predict that is going to collapse is also a product of the Oslo Accord. And you know the collapse of the PA, maybe it will happen, just will make us closer to the situation that the existence of the PA is blurred a little bit, that there's no self-governing that you like to base your autonomy plans. But the situation is that there are millions of people under our control without any rights and it brings us back to the main problem, which is moral, moral uh, security <laughs> and politically dangerous. <laughs> and that brings me to the next question, MK Yogev. You say the following. You say, you say to the Palestinians, say, uh, just tell me, uh, manage the, moderate the session, please. The uh, Palestinian Arabs to give them uh, uh, municipal autonomy with residence rights, not citizens. Some people say that there's going to be a large Arab minority between Jordan and the sea. This minority is a big and a very small majority, and I'm asking you how it tallies with your vision of a Jewish democratic state. First of all, you have to know the right figures. You know, uh, the 69th year of Israel, the data was 8.6 million 
people in the state of Israel add uh, to what was already checked about 2.4 uh, million Arabs in Judea and Samaria connect uh, the 1.9 of non-Jews and you get about two-thirds and a third. And when the de Jewish demography is growing, whereas the Arab demography is in retreat. These are the data, but together with that, the Zionist vision, uh, in the beginning we were 600,000 here vis-a-vis, -vis, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of Arabs, and we established the state. That's what Ben-Gurion decided. We see a vision, and we see in the last few years a better reality. The reality is uh, not detrimental. The future is sees shows that it's going to be better, both in demography. As for the Arabs in Judea and Samaria, I said, we won't be able to swallow them. It's not a national consent, but we'll give them the best uh, rights, rather uh, better than all the other uh, uh, other countries. As Rabin said, less than a state. The reality that they can manage their own life independently. If you want to live in peace, Joshua came to Israel and said, if you want to live in peace, welcome. If you want to go away, go away. You've got 20 countries. Some of them came here during the British mandate when because it was purpose. And if you want to fight, we know that too. We are in favor of peace and life. On the other hand, unfortunately, uh, we have to educate uh, our children this way. But they educate their children and continue to do so to kill us. We educate our kids to live in peace with them. Therefore, we should have the security control in our hands, and then there'll be more life, more stability for us and our neighbors. MK Kish, you're talking about uh, administrative autonomy. Let's hear exactly what you mean. And uh, I'm asking you, what exactly do we do with the Palestinians? But talk about the security now, because I looked a little bit uh, at the map, and I know it also. We're talking here about Palestinians of the sea zone. I know the figures that show on the one hand the minimum of 50,000, but I also know the maximum of 300,000 that seem a bit uh, close to reality. But let's hear you in A and B that you connect for autonomy. There are about 170 settlements, isolated small settlements. You cannot create a transportation sequence without us being involved in it. And all this sits in the heart of Israeli control. Okay, autonomy, but the Israeli control, how does that have an impact on us being a democratic and Jewish state? First of all, I want to relate to what was said before. I admit, I act as an Israeli. I uh, want uh, most of the area to be under Israeli sovereignty, minimum Arabs. Why? Because those Arab residents, they will be here. Uh, I, um, I, I don't care if it's A and B and C and whatever, although it does reflect reality because A and B are the places where you have the main Arab population. So it's true. We're talking about uh, some 20,000 Arabs who will get citizenship. But yes, I don't want a state of all its citizens, or all its infiltrators. I don't want that. I want a Jewish democratic state and that's why and uh, with all due respect to the interests that come from the left I want to preserve the Jewish identity of the state and what happens when there's no problem I asked the I answered the questions in your time I can ask answer you as well I want to say clearly regarding the transportation sequence that's the problem of uh, uh, Bennett, uh, just to have sovereignty on sea, actually there's no autonomy. It disrupts the whole area. I created the sequence by defining exactly what is the Israeli area where the autonomy people can cross and come. And now uh, give me another 20 seconds, please. 20 seconds. You get it. I want to say clearly the transportation sequence that will enable, enables the 
autonomous uh, settlement to act. Uh, eventually, this is going to be the reality. I don't want to go to a place where eventually either I lose the Jewish identity of the state or to put ourselves with all due respect uh, to the commanders of the army for a plan. We're not going to put our soldiers and our forces in places that they cannot protect. We'll maintain our borders and our identity and we'll make sure that there's a stable autonomy for the Arabs on the other side as well. Thank you. And now, Knesset member Shafir, I'd like to ask the following question, but with an emphasis on where is the the Jewish box in the <laughs> Jewish and democratic, uh, as you see it. We, it is in the interest of the State of Israel to remain Jewish and democratic for all the people that live here with a Jewish majority that assures that we will be able to guarantee our future uh, with the Zionist vision, all this in a state whose first interest is to secure the defense of all its citizens. I read uh, Kish's and Yogev's program and other people, I don't find any relationship to what happens to what happens when the Palestinian Authority uh, uh, falls apart. And uh, 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 the state of Israel, you said you read my program. It means that the state of Israel will take responsibility for all these services that need to be, for all the services that the Palestinian Authority took care of until now, from water and security, uh, domestic violence, I don't know what, uh, all the other things. Everything will be in Israel's hands, and that is before we talk about preventing terrorist attacks, which the PA took part in, at least partially. What happens to these pavilions that will be divided up in, I don't know, a hundred different autonomies? What happens when they ask for full citizenship in the state of Israel? What happens? What happens when Israel suddenly has a Palestinian majority? or even equal numbers of Jews and Arabs. What the right is talking about, and it's not all of the right, there are other people in the right as well, but what the extreme right is talking about, what we're hearing here, uh, in part, is not a security plan. It is a messianic plan. It is a faith-based plan. And Yogev said it correctly, but Salon Mutrich said it right. He said in the ISN and the Mossad, they become leftists over time. Why? Because they see what happens on the ground, because they live on the ground. But we, in the right, we have faith. And that's why we understand that it doesn't really matter what's actually happening on the ground as long as you have faith. We want security of the state of Israel. There is a... <laughs> what happens when the Palestinians demand citizenship? Do you give them full citizenship? No. I give them residency with a better life than they have in any other Arab state. That's what we give them. Without the right to vote? There is no perfect plan. You know, if there were a perfect plan, we can't give them the right to vote. That would be a catastrophe. And to give them their own state, that would also be a catastrophe. I can't do either of them. I'm building a, a until they understand that there is an iron wall here. So you're preventing this two-state solution. solution that the entire system believes in, including people who served with you in the army. I'm sorry, they're all talking together. In other words, you will end the Zionist regime. I'm sorry, I can't interpret when they're talking over each other. She's concluded. I've given Tamar Zandberg the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, the Zionist movement as a national movement is one of the wonders of the modern world. It established within a few decades from an idea that uh, was born in the mind of Theodore Herzl, a national home 
that is strong and safe. I don't understand the right or the justification that we draw to prevent that same exact right of self-determination to the members of another people. We came to a land that has another people, and these two peoples, we and the Palestinian people, have nationalistic aspirations that are very strong. That is the situation, and there's no way to assure those aspirations without dividing the land into two countries. The Zionist vision was the only way in which it was possible to have a Jewish and democratic state without a contradiction. That's the only way, a national home for the Jewish people in which every Jew in the world can find a safe asylum, and on the other hand, a democratic state that will have a, that has a national minority that has um, equal rights for all its citizens, as it says in the Declaration of Independence. The first threat, an immediate threat to that, is millions of people living under our rule without rights. Just as the Jewish people did not concede its rights, there's no reason that another people do it, and we're not demanding that they do so. And therefore, without any doubt whatsoever, and I don't think there can be any argument over it, is the only way to keep Israel Jewish and democratic without any contradiction, with the hyphen between them being a bridge. Now I'm going to change the order, and I want to address you in order to clarify how we're doing what you're suggesting. When the nation or the people are divided, actually, and all the, la the former elections, they voted against your and Stav's perception here. How do we do it? How do we act? First of all, I don't agree with you. Most of the MKKs in the Knesset today and most of the Israeli public, which is reflected in the Knesset, supports the two-state solution. Most people in this hall, maybe, but not Israeli public in general. All the opposition, plus the MKs, quite a few of them from the coalition, support the two-state solution. And so the public reflects throughout time and again for decades, but they vote differently in the ballot poll, somebody says. No, but I have to tell you here, the main barrier to the realization of it is not numbers, it's a political lobby. And I'm saying it loud and clear, the strong um, uh, political lobby of the settlers, which is today in the party of the Jewish home, eight seats. It's a very strong lobby that has an impact on the vote to the Knesset and is opposed uh, to the public. Uh, in Israel, that represents 4% of the public, 4% of the Israeli public lives outside of the borders and they are the ones who control our uh, future. This is absurd from a democratic point of view, but it's possible because of a political in, uh, strength and power. This has to be said, it doesn't represent the Israeli interests, nor most of the public. Thank you. So. You can say that MK Yogev have the same number of seats that Meretz has, so you don't have to exaggerate in the support of the Israeli support. It's not in all the settlements and not the positions of Yogev. And uh, the evidence is that the Prime Minister himself still officially Although he's trying to evade it, uh, because of the settlers, he's still saying that he supports the two-state solution. Uh, I also uh, sent a query to the ministers to ask, are you for annexations? Because they're talking about it for many times. And they said, uh, what is your security plan for the citizens of Israel? Gilad Erdan, he was here. We're talking about a minister who is in charge of the police and also strategic uh, issues. I asked him. And he said there's no problem. Even today, the police knows exactly what to do in Judea and Samaria. So I asked again, and I said, tell me, the moment we uh, uh, are sovereigns of Judea and Samaria, like the dreamers in this coalition are dreaming, what's going to happen there? The police takes into its hand all the activities of protecting the settlements. So IDF goes out, and then what? And uh, it goes to prepare itself in other places. Now the police is going to uh, deal with the rockets, and what about uh, thwarting 
targeting uh, um, uh, terror attacks and targeted killings, uh, internal policing, uh, water, family affairs, dealing with crime. Uh, this is going to cost how much in the budget? How many police officers will you need? Is the police ready to do it, including all the police cars, where they're going to be in areas where they can be shot at? at. What was his answer? Uh, Abu Mazen doesn't agree to talk to us. That's what he told me. He never said anything about the issues, which are the questions if you really want to annex. And even the distinguished people next to me, they're not saying even once what's going to happen when the Palestinians will want citizenship. The moment they'll agree to that, what's going to happen when Israel will be a Palestinian majority? What's going to happen when we become... When we become, you remember you said it's not going to be Jewish and democratic. That's the, it's very difficult uh, to talk when you're with a disruption. Mr. Kish was a military man. I don't know what happened to him, the man next to it. Okay, stop. Thank you very much. I want to conclude. Put a full stop. No. Uh, the security demands separation because you're putting us in a situation and you're not annexing. You are the in power for 200 years. Why don't you annex? Annex, you've got a majority, but you're not annexing. You're just talking. Okay, we got your point. Mr. Kish. Let's assume, I uh, understood how it works, but I got it. It's working well, and when you get more time, you're happy. When somebody else gets more time, you're not happy. So let's talk now. I want to ask you a question. You can relate to what you want, but uh, you'll have a minute and a half, no matter what you want to talk about. Okay, another 10 seconds. Now I'm asking you, tell me, let's assume, just uh, for the sake of argument, that the political situation changes, namely that the uh, government is elected uh, with uh, opinions that are similar to the two ladies uh, on your right. The and today there's a completely different uh, decision which uh, leads to the solution of separating from the Palestinians and not including them with us, maybe autonomy, maybe other possibilities, and there's such a decision. What? What are you going to do? How do you relate to that? What's your reaction to it? How do you plan as a politician to act? What do, you, what do you think about it? First of all, we're going to accept a majority rule. This is a democratic state. We accepted it also in the situation in the disengagement from Gaza, which is deportation from Gaza. And what is it? So what are the two ladies saying here? What on my left, actually? Uh, let's take the uh, Gaza model and we'll do it in the heart of the state of Israel. This, the area is going to be 50 times bigger, two meters from uh, the airport, and not now to invest two billion uh, dollars to build a uh, fence, but to do it. And but it, uh, this is such absurd. It's so, and now they're trying to teach us democracy. They tell us uh, that our uh, choice is not democratic. That the public that voted Likud doesn't want Likud. They actually want Meretz. That's what she's saying. So let's put things in proportion. Most of the people uh, is in the right because they learned from experience, experience, the bitter experience of Oslo, the disengagement that on the other side, there's one big X on the state of Israel. We in the right will not enable the situation to repeat itself. So you're saying, what if most of the people will think differently? Okay, we're in a democratic state and I accept the opinion of the people. I will stop. Struggle, I will fight, but of course I'll accept. As for the requirement for sovereignty, I um, accept uh, Stav's uh, wish for sovereignty. Since I've been an MK, I always talk about sovereignty. I'm not calling it annexation, it's sovereignty, because this is our area. Uh, we got it, uh, it, it belongs to us, we deserve it. And this is a Jewish settlement in the Judea and Samaria. Only recently, the center of the Likud passed a resolution that it wants sovereignty 
on the settlements in Judea and Samaria. And yes, I'm going to liberate and we're going to challenge the PM. And the PM never repeated the statement in Barilan. He said even then, he said with the thousand reservations, we're in a different situation today. The American uh, administration for the, uh, the eight uh, harsh years of Obama is finished. Now we see Trump, a new spirit. We're going to take advantage of it because eventually the international atmosphere is important as well and we'll do everything possible in order to uh, have sovereignty over these areas. Okay, Yogev, I would like to ask you about the, the democratic aspect of the Jewish and democratic in light of your, or in view of your plan. First of all, I demand equal rights. It's always the left, but I also demand it. Secondly, I said among the, the pillars, as I mentioned, I mentioned national consensus, and with national consensus is something we have. We have one-third of the people who are on the left, but the majority of the people believe that we should not move from a single community in Judea and Samaria and uh, even the head of the national camp, Avi Kabai, said so, and then most of the heads of the communities. Uh, please don't interrupt me. Please don't lie, she says. And some have suicidal thoughts about the, st the Jewish nature of the Jewish state. I respect those positions, but they are minority positions. Then people will uh, choose and elect the, the government, and this is what has led us over 2,000 years of exile. There is a clear majority for the Jordan Valley to remain our eastern uh, border. There is a clear majority that Jerusalem should remain Israel's capital and that no uh, settlements should be evacuated and that Israel always be a Jewish and democratic state. And as I said, I respect the view of the minority, but the minority must respect the view of the majority as well. I still have eight seconds, so the future, as I said, the, the future uh, works uh, for those who work for it. And I, I would like to boast, not proudly, but and not with contempt, but I think that there are wonderful people in the left. They should join the Zionist, Zionist actions. We will continue to climb the mountain. And unfortunately, they have remained behind, and the train will continue on its way. You can take a bus and join us. I suggest that no one uh, appropriate uh, Zionism and patriotism uh, and Judaism and democracy for themselves. Let's leave that on the side. They have, uh, the fact that they have been in the opposition for so many years is unfortunate. We are losing, uh, we're not gaining from wonderful, the work of wonderful people. Each of you will now have 90 seconds to either relate to what you want to relate, I suggest you also discuss the world, what the world will say, or how the, what the world will respond, or how the international community will respond, if you want to, to what you uh, would like to do. And you can also relate to what your colleagues have, have previously stated from right and left. MK, you give. It's 90 seconds. Let me sum up briefly. I said the first step is the first foundation is the belief that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people and those who ignore this point do so at their own peril. But that is the basis that is, and that is how we returned to Zion. Even Herzl said so, and it was based on what uh, Rabbi Saadia Gaon said, and this natural, historical, and legal right uh, uh, belongs to Israel, and we will not return to plans such as the Oslo Agreement. We don't, that's recent history. We don't have to go back in time. But the, the vision of the two states has been relegated to the dustbin of history. Uh, it, 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 is, it runs counter to our faith and s endangers our security. No other state, no, pa no Arab state will be established between the, the uh, sea and the river 
and uh, there will only be one state in that territory and we will continue to strengthen the Jewish settlement and we will gradually apply based on international consensus. My uh, colleague Kish is correct that there is an opportunity now with the new American administration. The previous administrators thought that we were the problem, that the Iranians and Palestinians were the solution and the current administration considers Iran the problem and the Palestinians and we will uh, give the Jews, the excuse me, the Arabs living in uh, Judea and Samaria residential rights, but the authority will belong to the state of Israel forever. Mr. Kish, I'll start with the principle of the plan to summarize. It's based on the principles of the autonomy plan of Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister. It uh, disqualifies a Palestinian state. Nobody is going to be evacuated, no Jew, no Arab. will have administrative autonomy to manage the issues of the Arabs. No return of uh, refugees, neither in the autonomy, not in any other place. Maximum territory under Israel's sovereignty with the minimum number of Arabs, all the Jewish settlement in Judea and Samaria under the Israeli sovereignty, the security and military issues is under Israeli hands. And as for the Arabs who are in Israel, they'll be able to decide to get Israeli citizens. Others can be without citizenship. Nothing is perfect. If you ask me where the problem is today, I cannot say whether the residents of the autonomy are going to vote in Jordan or some other solution, maybe with Gaza or something to that effect. At the moment, there's no answer. To that, I don't have an answer, and I admit. But if you want to give an answer here, you make a big mistake. Uh, either f to the security or to the future. I'm very happy. Many people related to my plan. I put something on the table since I became an MK. I did a lot of, I had a lot of meeting and I toured the area and I went with people, those who built the fence in order to bring a real realistic plan. And uh, 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 this uh, summarizes what the Likud believes in, and it talks about practical step when within Israeli uh, interest, we're not in collective suicide like the left is offering, and not a binational state because that will lose the entity of the state of Israel. I don't have answers regarding what's going to happen when we have three million uh, Palestinians. Okay, suicide, that's what you think. The right doesn't have a security paradigm out of a messianic ideology. <laughs> no security agenda. So look what happened. 40 years there in. Uh, 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 they told us in the past that they're against Oslo and against collaboration with the PA. Why didn't you stop the collaboration with the PA? Why didn't you do away with the Oslo Accord? You have a, a majority in the Knesset. You could have done it long ago because it's going to be dangerous for the state. You said that the disengagement was a big mistake. By the way, who uh, left Gaza was a right-wing uh, prime minister. That's what I remember. Arik Sharon was not in the left. You said it's a mistake. Why don't you go back to Gaza? Go, conquer again the whole area there if this is a terrible mistake. Two, two million Palestinians, we don't want them. That's why you're not, don't, not doing it. And then you say that the settlement is our security. If it's so, then why don't you put sovereignty onto the But you're here for 40 years and you're not doing it because you know that what's going to happen is two nations, we're going to mix into one another, there's going to be a civil war, both in the streets. What are you doing? Because you know that these plans are no good. The only thing that you're doing is to, to weaken, to um, diminish the Israeli democracy because you're talking in messianic words and uh, you are weakening the state because you don't rely on the IDF to do what it has to do. You don't rely on the IDF. You uh, do not believe that the IDF is capable to protect us, and I'm talking seriously, don't joke around. You do not uh, rely on the IDF, and uh, you think that you established, you have all these extreme uh, young people, organizations that go and uh, um, jeopardize uh, the Palestinian uh, villages and the soldiers. If everything is so good, and why don't you transfer to the settlements 
Why don't you deliver finances, but you do everything in a corrupt way, covertly, and uh, instead of uh, transferring the money directly, because you know that most of the Israeli public is against it. 65% of the public still, after all these years that you've been uh, in, in power, uh, they're against this plan. Tamar Zandberg, Tamar Zandberg, please. I want to relate to your question. How does the world relate to the whole thing? And to talk about some of the things that tell, tell us, they offer, the, 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 they tell us Trump is in favor of Israel. First of all, uh, complete support in Netanyahu on those dangerous uh, right-wing plans. That doesn't mean supporting Israel. The best support in Israel is helping the Israeli interest to reach a permanent agreement under safe borders. That's the Israeli interest, and that should be our demand to the world. But actually, let me delve more into it and to say that the support of the American administration in Israel not only doesn't strengthen us, but in a way it weakens the sta status of Israel vis-a-vis -vis our best ally, the United States, because the United States is uh, more than this administration. Actually, the segment in the United States that the strategic support to Israel is the Jewish community, and we know what their political opinions are. They want a democratic state, because polls that were held recently show a rise um, among uh, the uh, democratic, uh, they believe in the Palestinian, a very uh, worrisome decline in the democrat Democrats' support to Israel uh, today because of the government. And therefore, we are today in INSS, and this situation is a strategic danger to our national uh, security, and we have to think about that as well. Thank you, the MKs, Zandberg, Shafir. Kish and Yogev, thank you, and we are going ending this session.